Hello everyone, and welcome to quite a different episode of Fire Emblem Ignorant Dawn. Today is finally the day that we'll be going over unit analysis, something we haven't been doing throughout this Let's Play that I thought I'd throw all in one episode now because people want it so much. And of course, not only will I be giving my thoughts, but these thoughts will also come to you from the direction of Raisins. Hello dude, how's it going? Hello, I'm glad, I'm glad to know my direction here is uh, very useful. Wait, wait. My, the direction is in like I'm the one directing the video, where like it's I, going I thought, in the. I thought your analysis would come from your general direction, because I wasn't sure what other direction it could come from. Is there another ah, direction you'd enough. like to give him from? Oh, okay. That's fine. No, I'm no, flexible. No. I'm flexible. You can do either way. I was using the wrong direction. Okay, which, that's is, fine. which is a word whose definition is also very flexible, like you. Um, okay. But anyway, <laughs> I think we shall. <laughs> yes, let's shall. So we'll go over all the units. I don't know if this is going to be one or two episodes or a million, but uh, either way, we'll go over all of them the way you're used to. Except this time we have the benefit of hindsight because we've already been using these characters throughout part one. And we'll go over how they've been doing so far compared to maybe our expectations or how we usually use them. And of course, how we think they'll perform in the future, because there are still quite a few Dawn Brigade chapters left, and there's also part four and Endgame to worry about. Uh, I'm not sure if every part of these will be equally highlighted throughout, throughout the things, because for some characters, there's more to say on those fronts than others. Uh, but we'll get into that as we go along. Uh, I'll try to tackle them in join order, unless I forget someone. So I guess we could start with uh, Micaiah over here. Um, I... Micaiah is one of my favorite lords. Whenever people ask me, like, hey, what's your favorite lord? I'm always like, uh, I like Micaiah, I guess, because I don't know who my favorite is, but I do know I really like Micaiah because she's just so different from other lords. And I like this kind of glass candy build they went for. A lot of people don't like that Micaiah is so slow and she just kind of hits once and kind of hard. And she also dies to a stray breeze all the time, which is like, yeah, it's annoying because you can't just go burr with her, but it makes her an interesting unit to utilize. And in this playthrough especially, where I'm trying to avoid game overs to not have to turn wheel my way around, um, it's especially challenging to use Micaiah. Like, I think I started using Micaiah for like every combat I could early on, and then as the playthrough went on and on, I started using her less and less because it's just such a risk to have to risk a reset and a turn wheel use for Micaiah, like the Becca's turn wheel thing where every time I game over, I have to reset a chapter. Uh, I add one to the turn wheel counter, and then at the end of the playthrough, uh, there will be some kind of punishment, and I don't want. I'm gonna avoid that. So it makes me kind of really risky, and also it like just erases all my process, in it, all my progress in the map. So it's very scary, kind of like if you're doing an Iron Man. So yeah, I don't want to use Micaiah too much, but she does have her benefits if she does get close to enemies. She does have like really heavy chip damage. She does grant Soth plus two attack from her support, and Soth's unit I've used a lot in the playthrough, and having him have plus two attack, uh, plus four damage on a double attack is super huge. And there have been a couple times where I've had to like nuke an Armor Knight or a Cavalier uh, with Thane, and it's just been super helpful. Uh, so when I can get away with it, I try to do it, but not knowing for sure if I'll get away with it is what really makes me insecure with Makai, and I think that will be the case going forward. Uh, this save is from the preparations of the base of chapter, the final chapter of Part 1, uh, which means you don't see your promotion here, but when she promotes, uh, she gains stabs, which it, I would say it's one of the most role-changing promotions in the whole game, because... Up to this point, Micaiah can just sacrifice people for healing, and other than that, she's just chip damage and not a whole lot else. Uh, but in part three, I actually think she's one of the better units you have, uh, besides like your fighting carries, because she can heal people that are injured, and that's so massive, because then they can attack instead of using a Voln, or they can use a Living Grass like Volu. That's so big. It's so great to have that as an extra utility, and having her and Laura around just makes you so much safer in that regard. I really like that. I think I. It's just a, such a unique change to characters. Not a whole lot of Lord characters especially are like that. I do really enjoy that. And that's kind of like Mikai's role going forward. It's just a staff utility bot. I think occasionally she can use Purge to hit something. That's kind of about it. Um, she does, doesn't really become like a combat unit ever in hard mode unless you really go hard at it. And I think that's usually too risky. That's generally the way I go with Mikai. It's chip damage part one and then healing utility for the rest of the game. And that works out perfectly. Uh, makes her a solid character in my book or a solid unit in, in, in my book. What about you? Anything different for I definitely you? Feel, yeah, I, I, I definitely feel like kind of the same way about Mikai. I'm actually uh, kind of kind of surprised to hear that you like like her so much. Um, to, to be honest, I didn't really, I, I, I didn't really think that <laughs> I like her. That's why I keep her safe. <laughs> That's why I don't use her. I much. know. Yeah, you keep her safe. Don't, don't use her. I guess. Okay, so I, I will say part of it is like, but part of our hesitance to use her is because yes, it's an Iron Man, and yes, we can't really like see the stats or see if enemies have range attacks and whatnot. So mm -hmm. that's kind of that's that's kind of why we're not really using her a whole. Yeah, that's lot. huge. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, that's huge. 
Um, but in casual playthroughs, yeah, I'm absolutely like willing to use Makaya a whole lot more just for chip damage, just for support. Um, and I, I think it, it it's really easy to understand, like actually just how good sacrifice is. Uh, like it kind of looks like a kind of doo doo one use heal staff that you have like once per map, mm -hmm. right? Um, but let's not forget that you know you do have it all the time, and it does also cure statuses, which is actually a rather important thing for later on, and it's something that doesn't require any like real stats to do. The whole curing statuses bit, I have seen like a couple times in like the really far end game maps in particular where it does transform from a purely like health giving thing to now a status giving thing um and it can activate wrath builds on makaya too in case that's something you're really into right like they're it's kind of memey but if you're into it then you're into it right yep so sure. I, I do think the breath build can be funny mm -hmm. do you like do you um, get a lot of like utility out of it because i usually do it in one four and after that it never relevance again the wrath thing um i do resolve sometimes uh, oh yeah, because that. Mikaya's uh, I, that's uh, yeah because she can use that. She's the only tier one character that can do that, I think, right? Yeah, that's right. So I mean, if you you could like promote a character to tier two and have them do resolve play, but it can be sometimes harder to set up, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but that, that's a fun one to do. I will say I do also really just adore the whole like two range board thing where to total glass cannon. I think there's usually something like useful that Mikaya can do in like pretty much every single turn here. Where whether it's chipping someone or just giving Soth the support, uh, her affinity is even good for other people too. Like I've sometimes been known to like take off the Soth Makaya support and start building like a Makaya Z Hark support because uh, I do think that one is also pretty good. It just gives them plus attack and plus avoid, which are two things that he really likes having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never, I never consider breaking them up. I like the dark affinity a lot. It's yeah, like you said, it's it's plus two attack at A. I think uh, if she's with like an Earth support, I was always afraid that I would like compromise the the bonus of avoids too much to do that on someone like Z-Hark. Depends on like the, mo the mode you're playing, I guess. I think in normal mode, I yeah. wouldn't be too afraid to do it. And I feel like he needs the Earth, right, to get maximum avoid there. The the double Earth? I mean, yeah. so with with Dark Earth, he would get like, what, plus 30 avoid at A? So to, I mean, to be honest, I'd do it more for the plus might. Um, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the plus avoid is kind of like extra, if that. Because it's only, the, it's only plus 5 at a B support. But like, Still, he's getting a void from his own earth support. I, but I, I really did. I really do appreciate Micaiah. I think, I, I think that she does have this kind of like awkward period here where you had this combat unit, and now you have a unit who like can't. Like, like her, her combat's actually pretty good for like one P and one one, mm -hmm. and then in a lot of the other maps, it kind of feels like you had that taken away from you. But like, you know, she can still attack at two range. She can still do chip. She can still kill things with Fanny. And I really do think the physics staff utility in particular is like so amazing for part three. Yeah. Like it actually does hold together a lot of those maps if you're not able to really like rush or LTC them down. So, and I should mention too, uh, when we're evaluating these units, I, I don't think we're evaluating them like a strictly LTC context, no. right? So even though some nerd can come in here and be like, oh, well, they don't do this in my LTC. It's like, well, yeah, but like, you know, get out of here, nerd. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> Yeah, no, I think actually, if you really want to do LTC, I think you actually do have to train Ukaya because she can speed up 1-9 by a couple turns. And that's the kind of thing where I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not really going to take that into account. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> anyway. I'm not, not, not going to do any of that. But yeah, that's Makaya. I yeah. think total, totally great. Just, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. tons of utility in this unit. And you, you use her a bit more often because there's probably something useful you can do with her in every single turn. For sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're gonna try to go by join order. So I guess Edward is next because you know he's around. First time you see him, uh, mm -hmm. he hasn't grown a whole lot. I think I said at the beginning of the playthrough I was sort of vaguely planning on maybe using Edward if he got good level ups and he got good level ups. But I, in the back of my head, I kind of already knew I wanted to use Zhark as well. So it was really tough to justify using and deploying him, especially for the Dawn Brigade. I think they, as a whole, uh, you kind of brought it up for Makaya where you can't see ranged, uh, like if an enemy has a ranged weapon or not. I think it hurts the Dawn Brigade as a whole to an extent because it's so hard to get kills on units that you're trying to feed uh, when you're piecing them down like bit by bit because you have to do exactly enough damage, not too much that you can get the kill to the wrong unit and not too little that you don't have to end up getting the kill. And Edward can really get hurt by both uh, in addition to all the other problems that he already has on Radiant Dawn Hard mode. Uh, I think Edward is also the biggest victim of the problems with Dawn Brigade where you kind of, like when you first start playing this game, I've said this before, you want to train everyone because everyone seems so fun and like quirky in the early game. 
but once like 1-5 or 1-6 rolls around, you get so many of those units that you kind of want to train, and if you try to train all of them, all of them are going to fail. Like, they're just going to be too underleveled. Whereas if you focus on like one or two units, there's a chance that one or two of them will come out on top of be strong enough to, to carry. And this playthrough, that wasn't going to be Edward, unfortunately. But I do recognize that if you have an Edward uh, early on that's getting good level ups, uh, and he can really snowball out of control, even in hard mode, but you have to be pretty lucky. Like, his growths are insanely good, sure, but he has to proc them multiple times uh, while having to deal with hard mode, super restrained experience gains. I think Edward is a character that's... Edward might be the character that's most improved if you were to downgrade from hard mode to normal, even easy mode, because the snowballing just explodes out of control. And in hard mode, it's, it's just so painful to use, unless he gets super lucky. <laughs> and then uh, there was like one within one five, I think, where we had to kill a fighter and then we had to risk his life to basically survive with everyone else. And that's just that iconic Edward moment for me where it's just too risky to keep trying to train this unit. I think I even undeployed him in 161 just to make sure I didn't accidentally expose him and kill him somewhere else. I'd better have him be alive on the bench. Uh, they but deployed, yeah, undeployed a whole lot of people. <laughs> yeah, he was not the only one to be fair, but he's like a very typical example of uh, the kind of unit that I would undeploy there. And then I I will say I'm not a stranger to using Edward on hard mode, uh, but the last time I did it, what I did is I never used him after like 1-5 or so, and I deployed him in for prologue. I trapped a bow knight on a peeling bush, and I had him use his personal weapon to grind him down and let him heal up again uh, until I had Edward as a level, I think it was level 17 sword max. That video is still out there somewhere. I think it's called like the Edward grind or something. Uh, that is my last experience using Edward. I don't think I've ever... I don't know if I've ever done a playthrough where I've trained Edward all the way through the, you know, the non-insane way. Uh, I know the result, the end result is good for, for like part four, uh, but the, the way there is filled with pain and Legos on the ground, and I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, <laughs> it's but, just misery. Yeah. The, the one cool thing you get, though, if you train Edward is you can keep Wrath on him all the way, and then you can get kind of a funky skill set that people don't really have access to, because when you join with a skill, they don't take up capacity with that skill unless you remove it and put it on them again. So you can have combos that other units do not have access to. But the return of that usually doesn't see play maybe in part three, but I think generally in part four is when you really can make use of those kind of combos. And that's kind of far away for a tier one unit. Uh, so definitely a fun project unit, but if you really like Edward, I honestly recommend playing normal mode and using him there. I think that's much more fun than using him on hard mode. But if you're into it, Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's your game. <laughs> knock yourself out, or I knock mean, your Edward out. Whatever, whatever usually happens first. Uh, for me, that's usually the latter. What about you? Yeah, it's. I mean, I, I think I have trained him up on hard mode before and gotten like an okay result. I think I could like, I I, I could maybe try and pull out the file and see exactly like what it was uh, that he managed to get to. But he's. I, I mean, he's like the growth unit of the game, right? Mm -hmm. Like. If if there was if there was one, it, it's got to be Edward. Where like, not only does he have really high growths, and not only does he start at a really low level, there's also this analog unit that joins like, basically right afterwards, right? That he has to compare to. Like if he like, like for for example, Franz wouldn't be considered like a growth unit if he wasn't right there next to Seth all the time, right? Yeah, I suppose. It's, I suppose it, it's it's kind of the same thing with Edward and Zhark. Where like, okay, there's this guy. Zhark who shows up later. I, I have the, I have this. This is a pet peeve of mine. I'm sorry. This is a pet peeve of mine. But let me say hypothetically, what if Zhark was not in the game? Would it change anything about the way you evaluate Edward, though? I mean, no. To be honest, like I'll I'll, I'll totally admit I fell into your trap. No, it would not. Not one bit. Um, it's just like the way the reason I bring this up is because like there's such a like there's such a clear like bar that Edward has to pass. Mm -hmm. That's true. For, like, for someone to reason, because at that point, like, if you're deploying him on, say, like, 1-7 or 1-8, like, it's out of pure favoritism, right? Like, I get it. Um, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with using your favorite units. It's just, like, he's got a, he's got a long ways to catch up. And uh, I feel like on hard mode, the EXP just isn't, just isn't really there. I think it's better to just kind of, like, ignore the fact that this guy can level up really, really far and just replace him with a better unit whenever a better unit comes around and that's kind of that, that's kind of like the story of radiant dawn really is to just kind of like especially if you're playing on hard mode just kind of like abandon the idea of leveling up someone from level one to level 20 20 20 and just kind of like use the better units as they show up mm -hmm. if you want to make it easier for yourself of course 
Yeah, yeah. Like the yeah, easiest path to the path of least resistance is that way. Yes. Path of path, path of least resistance. Honestly, yeah. When you start a map, just like sort your units by level and deploy the highest level ones, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> is one of the easiest ways to do it. But I, I do think like okay, I've, I've spoken enough about his growths and his shortcomings. I actually do think I, I should talk about his early game a little bit, where he is actually like pretty useful in some of the opening maps right like he he's does the best unit have, for like one map <laughs> yeah he's the best unit for one map he's still a pretty good unit the next one too like he's still doubling things he we, we were still like procking wrath and trying to get crits off of that um like his combat is still actually really good pretty much up until the first time you get base preps yeah uh because before then he's he's able to like 1v1 most of the enemy units even even when he's only at base um an easy thing you can do to improve his performance is of course get his sword rank up and actually get the steel sword it's technically an option to not get the steel sword but picking it up is still like pretty good and you might be scared to use it because it reduces his as like he'll level strength bro trust um <laughs> isn't this base level four his bay yeah he's earned strength every time but you know uh -huh. he gets minus four <laughs> strength from this like i said he'll level strength trust uh -huh. um and also, like, when you're not playing on ignorance mode, it's pretty clear, like, which one's the correct tool for the job, right? Like, you have yeah. the combat forecast, so. Um, but just getting it for that early boost is actually rather useful. Uh, after that point, he kind of, he stops doubling people. His stats aren't really good to tank. He's not doing any damage. And, like, you can continue to funnel EXP into him. You can get a really cool unit at the end. Um, but I think just kind of, like, use them for the time when his stats are actually really good. Because um, they are great there, for that moment. Yeah, I'd never describe them as great, but they're sufficient for the, the spot you're in. I, I, um, do you remember when I made uh, that series uh, unit stocks? Did you ever watch those? Oh yeah, I, I watched. Uh, I think I watched the first one. Yeah. Yeah, there was a good comment on those because unit stocks is where I rated all the units from like one to ten in every chapter they're in, and so I made a little graph, like a line graph, of like how their progression is throughout the game. And Edward was submitted. Uh, I forgot who for a moment. And he start. I had him start off as a ten because I was like, "Alright, the best unit in a chapter is always going to be a ten out of 10. And then for Edward, it was a declining line. Like every new chapter in Dominic is a unit that joins that's better than Edward. Pretty much a trend throughout the whole game. Uh, sometimes even multiple. And um, I was like, it doesn't really work super well. That kind of like that kind of grading. There was something wrong with it. And someone in the comments posted a very good suggestion. They said, well, sometimes there might just not be a 10-10 unit. Sometimes there might, even the best unit might not be a 10 out of 10. Uh, I'm, I don't know if I would give Edward a 10 out of 10 for the early chapters. Even for one prologue, like, he's not that great, right? He's just, he's two rounding enemies and he's getting like three shot or something like that. It's not, there's, I mean, like, he's, he's not, okay, so Edward and Har are not the same 10 out of 10. There's a difference between okay. them, even taking into account, you know, they're, they're being different chapters. Edward and the Black Knight are both, if you, you can't bait, you can't say they're both 10 10s in the same way. They're, they mean totally different things. So I was thinking maybe Edward is more of like a, a 7 or an 8 out of 10 in, in one prologue. And there just isn't a better unit, even though there, there just isn't a 10 10 unit in that chapter. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's what Edward makes you feel like in the early game. I mean, but like, you know, two rounding enemies and dying in like three attacks, is that not something like, you know, Boonstick plus Frederick does too? Like, yeah, for so, several months? Yeah, if, if you apply that logic consistently, then you might also have to say, okay, Frederick isn't a 10 out of 10 unit in the, you know, Lunatic plus mm -hmm. Awakening Prologue because he can die in that many amount of hits. He's just a 10 out of 10 unit in normal mode, maybe hard mode or something. That I might be the true. way you have to apply that logic. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I honestly I was trying to like trap you in your own logic, but I think you, <laughs> you you've actually applied it fairly. So no, you're you're totally right. Yeah, that said, I would, I I don't play Lunatic Plus much on Awakening. I know there's people who play that a lot more. Uh, mm -hmm. I I think you could maybe make a case that he, that's the case there. It's kind of a tangent, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's possibly. We've got to talk about Rainy Dawn units. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. But it's also I uh, it's in, I'm, I want to think about this now, but we do have Rainy Dawn to talk about. <laughs> that is interesting, though, <laughs> that you brought that up, because that is that is a consequence. It's like, I, I do like having a consistent logic when tiering, but sometimes it isn't possible. And mm -hmm. uh, you might have just found a reason why. Uh, but yeah, are, are, is there anything else you want to say about Edward? Um... I, I really can't say. I think mm -hmm. there, I think there's like potential later. Oh, he does have he does have a nice PRF, and I think if he gets like a plus one proc on speed or so, or, uh, then he like doubles on transform the goose 
with oh, his yeah. PRF. That's nice. So. Doesn't, he, doesn't he get like two shot by Hunter Storm like lose two with <laughs> base? Details. <laughs> Details. <laughs> Storm punches him in the face and just dies. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, he gets pretty low, uh -huh. but you know. Um, yeah. For sure. Uh, yeah, let's let's get to uh, the next guy, but unfortunately he is no longer with us. It's uh, Leonardo, but fortunately, Raisins, I did give you a screenshot for reference if you want to look at his stats before he uh, he left us. Um, That's right. I'll probably edit it into into the video. Uh, I was really hoping to show more of Leonardo because I think the way he was used and then the way he died were a perfect demonstration of what to do and what not to do with Leonardo as a unit. I I think he is. Honestly, I wouldn't call him excellent or anything like that. Like obviously his stats are Garbo, but I think he is so circumstantially useful despite everything that's wrong with him that I don't want to call him bad. I've really grown to really appreciate Leonardo as of late, despite his limitations. Within his limitations, I think Leonardo is just so nice to have. And I, I don't want to say like so great or broken or whatever, because it obviously doesn't describe Leonardo, but there's two things about Leo that I think, well, three things that make me, like, say he is useful to have almost every chapter that he's around, despite, like, even if he gets no strength procs, like ours, or no speed procs. Uh, one of those yeah. is obviously having two range. The enemies usually don't counter him. A uh, bit of a problem in ignorance because, you know, you don't always know if an enemy is a hand axe unless you're raisins. You've studied these things in depth and become the ignorant person themselves. Um, then there's the... That's the thing I was able to show the most. And ironically, he died to an archer. And I think that could attack him. <laughs> and yeah. then... Uh, the other two things are uh, weapons that he gets upon promotion, basically. Uh, chapter 3-6, the next Dombricade chapter. Uh, he gets a personal weapon called the Lunasad, I think it's what it's pronounced like. I know how to spell it, which uh, is like a rare occurrence in the environmental community, yeah. I think. Uh, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, but L it's... L Lunasad is totally correct. Nice. It's, it's a, I think it's an 18 might bow that gives plus 5, 15 speed. Like plus, plus 15, plus 5 speed. There we go. That's it. Um, plus 5 speed. Uh, it's probably not going to make a double a whole lot. Maybe from Lagoos, but I'd have to check the numbers on that. Maybe like from Tigers. Uh, but the, the key feature is it has this, like, it has so much might. If you give him Beast Foe, he will one shot um, or do a lot of damage to enemy Lagoos. Uh, set him up for someone else to kill, maybe. Uh, or you just don't give him Beast Foe, just use him for chip damage. That's totally valid and super nice um, and just useful. And because he shoots from two range and most enemies in part three, and most enemies in the game, only have one range, it's usually not a drawback to him as long as you can kind of wall him in. That sounds difficult and tedious and annoying, but it usually works out because Dawn Brigade chapters are so cramped. And usually someone like Edward's, uh, like the support partner, like someone like Nolan, can just slot in, be in front of him and finish the enemy off. Uh, that, the Leonardo's strength is so garbage, so sometimes that's not going to be enough, especially in part one before he gets to Lunasad. So I remember like in the early game, there would be moments where I was like, well, I could have Leo chip this guy, but I have to finish him off. And I'm pretty sure that Leo's chip is not going to be enough to set up the kill for someone else. It takes like, usually it takes Leo and then someone else and then someone else on top of that to finish off an enemy early on, depending on who it is. Mm -hmm. Like something yeah. like Leo plus Edward plus no one would kill an enemy or something. That's still kind of iffy, but usually you can find weird spots where Leonor can help out that way. And the other thing that makes Leo's strength not as significant, and all of his other drawbacks less significant, is the crossbows that he gets. Uh, those ignore his awful strength, they just have like an insane amount of might. I forgot exactly how much, I think it's like 28 for the weeks, one or 24. And then yeah. if you use them against like a bird, they just melt, they just die in one hit. Uh, and there's, like, there's some Pegasi in chapter 312, uh, there's some Hawk Lagoos in chapter 313, uh, there's more Falcon Knights or Pegasus Knights or whatever in part 4. All those he could just take down for you and as long as you're very careful about him, it usually helps you more than it hurts you. It's not... There's definitely times where you can't use him because it's just too dangerous for Leonardo. And like like we've demonstrated, if you do it wrong, he will die. He's just... Just like the Pegasus I just mentioned, he just melts. He's just gone. It's like, just... You're, you're guaranteed to lose him. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you have to ask yourself the questions, can Leo survive this enemy? Just, the answer is usually yes. I found this a very annoying way to get, for example, game overs in 1-3. It's like, can he be a survival fighter? No, he gets one and killed. He's just done. He's just done. So, given careful play, he can work out and play to your benefit. That said, if you want to be super careless and bungling throughout the game, Maybe working on Leo long term isn't a great idea for you, but I think I find with like just leveling up to 10 and promoting him with a Master Seal, and then just honestly, if he just stays a sniper for the rest of the game, he can kind of earn his keep. And I appreciate that. I think that's better than a unit that is only really useful in the long term. 
uh, if these growths are used like all the time, like Edward, I find Leonardo much more easy to use. And I think most people, most casual players of Radiant Dawn, would really like Edward more than Leonardo because he has that long-term potential. But I appreciate what Leo can do with how little you have to give him. Um, but that said, you do have to be super, super careful with him. And that's, in the end, not what I was. And that's why he died. And that's why I'm sorry. And uh, thanks for coming to my TED Talk about Leonardo. I really appreciate this unit now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, de definitely an underrated unit. Uh, he's the kind of guy, like, kind of, again, hearkening back to your unit stonks thing. I think that if you took, like, the initial Dawn Brigade members, like, before Soth, actually, if really, like, a, a lot of the initial ones, and you kind of, like, took their unit stonks at each point and added up the area under the curve, I think Leonardo would be, like, far surpassing Edward, far surpassing Laura, probably even surpassing Nolan, if I'm honest with you. Uh, just because of, like, what he's capable of. Uh, even at base, right? Like all of these things you mentioned, we we should have clarified. Like all these things we mentioned are actually true of even base Leonardo. Like if he never levels strength, if he never levels speed, he mm -hmm. can still all be doing these things. Ours never levels strength and speed, by the way. He was I would I would have been able to demonstrate all that so beautifully. Mm -hmm. so right. Still sad. I'm, I'm surprised one thing you um, failed to bring up was the water support. Yes, good uh, one. Which he can so he can just bond support anybody and give them. Um, plus 0 0.5 attack and plus 0 0.5 defense. And in this game, those round up. So he immediately gives them plus one attack and plus one defense. Uh, just any anyone you want, any any unit you want. And that kind of bump to the hard stats, it might seem pretty minor, but the probability that it puts them over like at least one threshold is actually rather high. Um, whether it be like a bulk benchmark of needing to survive such and such many enemies or um, just just the extra attack needed to hurt someone or even like just extra attack on Leonardo himself is even valuable. Like water water affinity really is like one of the best affinities in Radiant Dawn. It's like that and then heaven and then earth, right? Like th those are the best ones basically. And then using that again, just giving it to anybody again, it's something you can do at base. He's got a lot of chapters to build it up with units like Nolan or with units like if, if, you, if you break those support with Micaiah, you can do the South support and then there you go. Now he's still getting the plus one, right? Um, well, yeah, just t tons of utility there. I do think, like, as far as potential as a growth unit goes, m the only really interesting thing to talk about is that, like, Lunasad, his his PRF is maybe a more interesting weapon for endgame things. Like, I know there's, I, I I know that like people use the double bow a lot in endgame, for example, and like Lunasad is kind of interesting because it lets them like double certain enemies that are impossible for sharpshooters to double or marksmen rather. To double otherwise but I, that that's it, it's such a narrow piece of utility that i, I don't really think mm -hmm. there's worth I, I don't think it's worth talking about too much as like super super late game growth unit potential mm -hmm. i do like that you brought up double bow though because that's like the one redeeming thing for uh like the sniper tree in this game is that they get a really good end game weapon uh, obviously leo's not the, probably the worst sniper to bring to end game just on stats alone but if you've already used him anyway then you might as well i think actually yeah, I used Leo in my last Iron Man because I was bribed into it, and I brought him to end game. I think I didn't manage to cap it out of strength, but everything else was relatively easy with like hoarding Bex and a little bit of grinding maybe. And then mm. uh, it, the double bow alone is enough to make a unit pretty good, along with the marksman's like option of using three range is just so good that you can afford to have lesser stats if you're willing to go a little slow. Yeah, really excellent all around. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, that's pretty much what my thoughts on Leo. Yeah, same, same, same. Uh, yeah. That means Lolan <laughs> Lolan is next, Ooh. I think. A Lolan Nolan. A Lolan Nolan. <laughs> a Lolan Nolan. Uh -huh. I, um, I think Nolan's base level is 9. I don't remember how his growths were exactly. I know I was complaining about him a bit, even though I was trying to raise him. I think he got like one early bad level up, and then he got a couple good ones. That's how I roughly remember him. And my my view on Nolan is, in a way, similar to the other Dombra game members. Is like, yeah, if you want to use him, you got to focus into him and ignore most of the other ones, if not all of them. I think in one playthrough I did, I trained only Nolan and Jill. I thought that was okay. Uh, and there was one other playthrough. I think my, yeah, my, let's play with Bismix. I think I just trained a lot of units. I was like, all right, whatever. All these units are going to be crap, but it's fine. I'm using them all. So I trained Aran, I trained Nolan, I trained Jill. Uh, I must have trained like at least one or two other units. I think... Uh, I don't remember who, maybe Edward. Uh, that was the uh, the infamous Noodle Arm Nolan, was it not? Yes, that was the infamous Noodle Arm Nolan. That's where it really came back to to bite me. That playthrough also showed me that Nolan really has a struggle in Part 3 to survive, despite him having a reputation of being a tank. 
It might have been because it was also a little bit defense crude. It might not have been, I don't remember. I just remember being really scared, especially by the Tigers in the part 3 maps where... Um, even with the Tarvos equipped, I'd just be really scared of losing Nolan like every single turn because... Those guys just hit really, really hard. The demand is just so high for a tank character. If you have Nolan trained though, he is definitely... I'm not sure if I could call him the best at it because Volug exists and Toronio exists. Uh, but I know he was like on par with Toronio on durability wise at least. And then Volug is just, I mean, it's hard to be Volug at anything really at this point in the game. Uh, that said, before you get to part three, uh, Nolan is de definitely one of the better Dahmer game members just by default. He has the same problem as the other early ones where every chapter someone will join that's better than him. Uh, but if, you know, if there's a tier one unit you want to train in Dahmer and it's not Jill, then it's definitely Nolan because his stats is hold up by far the best out of them. And, you know, just, they're, they're pretty nice. If I didn't have a Master Steel consumed by a dying Leo, I'd definitely have promoted him. But I didn't have a spare one uh, while also doing the Ileana trick that I showed in Endgame. So I think he might just stay a fighter for the game unless yeah. I manage to train him, like, naturally to level 21. Uh, yeah, but, that uh, seems unrealistic. Yeah, <laughs> but you never know. If Cyhark dies, we might have to. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think Nolan is, is, like, solid overall. I, I do think in hard mode... I don't know if I... It's it's hard with Nolan, because I think it's like basically exactly in the middle between all the all the broken units and all the bat units, where it's like... I'm not sure if training Nolan actually makes your life easier overall, uh, even on the first playthrough, or whether it's better to actually just recommend somebody to stick to the broken units. But if someone like Nolan isn't good, then I don't even know what to, what to tell you about raising units. It's like, it might just be a pitfall overall in raiding Dom, but it's just so enjoyable. Like, it feels weird to play a Fire Emblem game without going for a growth unit at all, so... If I had to recommend one, it'd probably be him or Jill, but, you know, y'all know how I feel about Jill. I yeah. I like Nolan a lot, uh, but I've never felt like the payoff is big enough to put up with having to feed someone all the time. It's kind of the way I feel about Nolan, but I do think he is serviceable, and if you want to train him, you should use him, and he's definitely a lot better to work with and then trying to long-term growth units on like Edward or Leonardo or Meg or Fiona or all those kind of use Mikaya too. Like, he's definitely better than all those by a long shot. He's definitely much more trainable and much more tolerable as a higher base level. Um, generally better stats too. Tarvos is great, just plus five defense on top of his already, like, decent HP and everything else. There's nothing wrong with Nolan, it's just he's in a game with a lot of more broken units that I find it tough to, like, recommend training him. You know, it's, it's a hard dilemma because when you look at Nolan, yeah, you know, yeah. he looks good, right? He looks good. Like this has like it has to be the one. Like if there's if there's anybody from the Dawn Brigade who can escape this pit, it's got to be Nolan, right? But uh, I so as far as Nolan goes, I, I do think there are actually like a couple of things that like really do help him out over the other Dawn Brigade members. Not just his, and this is just beyond his stats and his bases. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is that uh, he uses axes, which is not only the best weapon type in Radiant Dawn, it also means that uh, early on you can pretty safely make him like a really amazing forge uh, because you know that even if Nolan ends up going pretty poorly, like at the very least, you can just pass it on to Jill and like that will still work. Um, he's kind of similar to Edward in that respect, whereas, you know, another unit such as, say, Leonardo or forging multiple swords uh, for, you know, say, Edward and Meg, for example, uh, that could end up being kind of like a dubious investment because... Like if you if you make a really kick-ass forge for Leonardo, well, unless you pass it to the Grail Mercenaries, <laughs> Leonardo is the only person who's ever going to be able to use that until like four dash P. And so, what if it ends up being an inappropriate weapon for Leonardo? Let's not forget he gets Lunasod later. Like, is this oh, is this a wise investment? Whereas yeah. with Nolan, you can just kind of like you know hold hold down the right arrow key and just forge him like as much stats as you want, and <laughs> like he it, it's really going to work on him. Uh, you're, you're gonna get a really great result. Yeah, and that's exactly what we did. We gave him the Wi-Fi axe and then gave it to Jill. Yeah, <laughs> exactly what we did. Yeah, no, it's it, it, it's a good strategy. Um, also, axes just being good in general is rather nice. Another thing is that because he starts at the high base level, um, like I think that if I like watched a hundred, you know, Radiant Dawn playthroughs and saw them get the Master Seal, I think like maybe 95 of them would use that first Master Seal on Nolan just because it's so like, it's so obvious that like, he's ready to promote, right? And maybe like another four of them would use it on Ilyana and then the other ones would be like, you know, just saving it up for later or something, right? When you say um, watching, what do you mean like, you watch other people play Radiant Donna, most of them Master Seal Nolan at some point? Yeah, I think so. Oh, like, that's, with the that's first odd, because yeah. most people I see play 
when they have like a, a Dom Brigade member that they're investing a lot into, they will train them nearly or all the way to 20 and then sometimes they'll get tired of the XP that it takes to promote him naturally and so they'll use a mass suit like 18 or 19 or so, but most mm. people don't ever promote Nolan, I thought, so we must be watching different people, I guess? Well, I think what happens is they are still doing that. It's just the growth unit they've chosen is Edward and not Nolan, and so they're treating Nolan as like a Jagan. Oh. As like a basis unit. It's like, ah, oh, let's just promote this guy. Why not? And they keep and then they keep training Edward, but they have like a slightly tankier Nolan. That's fair. Um, I guess if you're not doing the Ileana thing, that you do have to spare Master Seal anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and that 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 is one thing to his credit. I think lately I've been doing more uh, Master Seal Ileana. I think that's just like slightly more valuable than Master Seal Nolan. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, he, he is a good candidate for a very early Master Seal in that regard. And I think those are the things that are like really helping him um, compared to some of the other compared to some of his other contemporaries in the Dawn Brigade is that he does have access to access and he does have this fast um, Master Seal. Mm -hmm. um, kind of what's not helping him because again, like he's such a he's such a middle of the road unit. Like you can't tell is it, is he one of the good ones or is he one of the weak ones? Maybe he's like the middle of the line, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I can't call him bad. I, if I had yeah. to put him like on one side of the line, it'd be good, right? I, I feel like if, if I had to put him on one side of the line, I'd put him on the bad, to be honest. You would? Like, oh, here's well. why. Okay. Here, here's why. He, he, he's he got a bit of Ford syndrome going on, all right? Where like, ev like everything he does is kind of like a little bit inadequate to begin with, which means that in order for him to really be good, um, he needs to level up everything at least a little bit, right? And like leveling up lots of stats over the course of your level ups, that's that's pretty likely. Leveling up every single stat at least a little bit is actually like very unlikely. Like there's a decent chance that you're going to be stat screwed in at least one stat. And for Nolan, I mean, like you mentioned, you had the Noodle Arms Nolan, you had the Nolan who was less tanky than you thought he was, right? Like you have the Nolan who sometimes has difficulty doubling because yeah I mean, especially early on he's weighed down by the axes yeah, i find he but... doesn't double even that much in part three and then sometimes he gets mm -hmm. doubled by cats i think which is kind of atrocious but if you have beast photo it doesn't matter yeah you just you just one shot them anyway but like w when you're in fire emblem really there, there's two there like like there's two ways to be like really good at combat in fire emblem and that's either have one of your stats be like ridiculously high right like if you're if you're like a general walking around with 30 defense very early on it's like okay well <laughs> It's very clear how I can make you useful, right? Either do that or have all of your stats be better than all of the enemy's stats. And it's like Nolan doesn't really belong to either category. He does briefly belong in like all of my stats are better than all of your stats for like his joining map and the maps after that. But then afterwards, in order to do that, he has to level up all of his stats, which is not really very likely. Mm -hmm. um, I guess. So I do think that he kind of falls off in that regard. Like that that's what I find when I end up trying to train Nolan is like something is gonna be short. Right? Like something is going to be not enough. And it, it could really be anything. It could end up being his strength, it could end up being his accuracy, it could end up being his defenses, even with the Tarvos boosting his defense by a few points. I, I feel like that's really what's holding Nolan behind. Yeah, I, I agree with you on the point that uh in any given playthrough, he'll probably miss a benchmark, be it strength or durability or or speed. Uh I'm not sure if I agree that uh, a key that you have to, that in order to be good in farming, you have to have one ridiculous stat or you have to outclass the enemy in all aspects because I don't know, it feels kind of arbitrary to me. I think, like, what if you're just like just fast enough to double and then just kind of tanky, you could still be kind of useful, right? Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess that would well, make you vulnerable to being RNG screwed. So, I guess that kind of goes into your point. Yeah, I, I can I, see I, that. I just wouldn't phrase yeah. it like that, I guess, is what it is. Okay, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I should asterisk like what I'm considering to be like a good unit is like like in, in, in this context someone who just chips an enemy once is not like a good unit by that evaluation right mm -hmm. like I'm kind of there's kind of a bar that I'm setting like slightly higher than that um, but well, I, I, I kind of agree I think that point needs some working on let's not dwell on it a bit mm -hmm. but like that's kind of an idea I wanted to present to you guys mm -hmm. I guess uh, we'll see if it's popular in the YouTube comments but... <laughs> we'll see <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Okay, uh, how about we move on from Nolan? Uh, I think Laura is next? Yeah, but she joins in the next chapter. I put him in order. I don't know why I'm why I'm second guessing this. Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, this one will be a lot more simple, I think. So, I think we've already covered the value of uh, of healing. You just kind of give another unit another turn to 
do things instead of using a Volnery and you save Volnery uses as well. That's both very valuable. Uh, I I just enjoy fielding Laura in pretty much every map she's in because I usually when a unit gets damaged, I just want to heal them uh, and then mm -hmm. keep using them. That's kind of the way I think about it. More cleverer players than me will be like, they'll play a game like FE12 where healing isn't as effective and they'll be like, well, I can have this unit go up to these three enemies, get beaten near death, get healed to the point where they can take two more enemies and I'm just going to keep repeating that process. And imagine that process, but then like 10 more times with 10 different units in 10 different situations in the same map. And that's too big brain for me. I just want to say, okay, uh, that unit got hit and then I'm going to heal them and then they're going to get hit again. And then I'm just going to repeat the process, take it easy, bait and switch a little bit. Basically, healers just make your life very easy, especially in ignorance where you don't exactly know what's coming, but you know your best odds of surviving are just bringing a unit back to full health every time. That's going to that's gonna work most of the time, especially if you have a rough idea of how many hits your unit can take. And Laura is perfect for that, especially because of the limitations of sacrifice. Um, you just want to heal, and you know, healing good. Uh, it's going to take a while to promote Laura because this is not a game where they fixed staff XP gain, uh, at least not enough to my taste. It takes a little bit before Laura can get anywhere. Uh, even with a hard mode XP being so rare as it is, like where you get like 10 or 20 XP for a kill at some point, uh, it still doesn't. It still outpaces healing XP by a lot because I think men still gets like 20 XP max, maybe even less. It's just it doesn't go very fast, especially because it's like one per turn. But eventually we'll have a master on Laura, and she'll have like a little bit more move, and I think some other benefits that I forgot about. I just know it helps a little bit with something. I just don't remember exactly what it does, uh, but I know it's helped me in the past. I'm gonna do it again. I saved a master for her. Um, Laura is precious. I. She heals people. She also dies to literally everything, which is very easy to yes. remember in ignorance. Like just if you're wondering which unit you should leave in range, it's usually just not Laura. Just don't put Laura in yeah, range. There's literally no benefit to it. So just uh yeah. The first thing I worry about in my turns is like, okay, where am I putting Laura and Micaiah, generally speaking? Like there was like a good turn in the, I think uh, the final chapter of part one, where I was like, Well, I don't have many safe spaces, but the first ones I'm gonna find are going to go to Laura and Micaiah because they're gonna get melted by everything. And, and like, even if it's just like a Lumbo Archer. They're gonna die, so put them out of range, and they'll be safe. That's the main drawback, but it's so worth dealing with because the return is just so great. And, and I think she's valuable throughout the game. I think earlier, Raisins, you said not to call you out, not to put you on the spot, but earlier mm -hmm. you did say that you thought Leo's unit stonks would be beating Laura's. I'm not sure about that. I, I like them both a lot, actually, but I, I usually find Laura is super helpful in every single map she's in. Although late game, I guess you don't need healing, but you also don't really need Leo. It's usually like a convenience kind of thing. So. Not sure where I stand on that, but I, the fact that they're even being compared here, I think says a lot about both of them, because we mm -hmm. really praised Leo's um, low, um, low input, high output kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, Laura's super great. Uh, early, not, right now it's just healing. Later on, it'll also be like restoring people that are like silenced or put to sleep or something, uh, or maybe giving a ward or doing a physic from afar uh, or putting people to sleep, stuff like that. It's just there's a lot of little things that staff users can do throughout the game and. Uh, yeah, I think she has some longevity. Uh, her her level will be like low always throughout the entire game, uh, but Pretty level much. doesn't always reflect how good a unit is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how you know you, you talk about saving a master seal for this unit and doing so very late on, and th this is the game where a lot of people can like twenty one and then twenty one and then twenty again, right? And mm -hmm. we're talking about ooh, she can hit level ten in tier one. Yeah, that's like a, that's a real thrill. Um, <laughs> <but> <laughs> no, but. Uh, I, I do think that uh, kind of kind of your comparison to Leo is interesting because again, what were we talking about with Leo? Like how much you can get versus how much you invest. And I think Laura is a very similar story where you don't have to invest like anything. Mm -hmm. um, some gold, maybe. Yeah, some gold. I, I I think I did mention maybe this was back in like one four. There was like a men's stuff. For yeah, sale. I bought a later one. Up, yeah, yeah. I, I I said I like to purchase that men's stuff. You kind of you kind of scoffed at me. Um, <laughs> But um, that that's like basically that's the investment that you make in Laura, and then like maybe maybe she and Laura like split the cost of a physics staff later on down the road, right? Mm -hmm. You you would be foolish to skip that physics staff in three six. Like, come on, like I, I don't know mm -hmm. anyone who's ever done that. No, Least of all me. It's like four thousand gold, but uh, damn, you never want it. Yeah, it's four thousand gold. I mean, you have like ten k there anyway, right? So do you? Or do you okay. know? Is that the the convo with Pelias? I think. No, oh no, the 10k you get later. 
I know you have uh, you have like a lot of gold optionally in the Dom Brigade. The problem is I want to send a lot of it to the Grand Mercenaries, and I did. So I hope I'll have the 10k because yeah. I really would like more more money, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna get it. That's the thing about the Dom Brigade. Their items are like cracked. Uh -huh. Like like their item game is way better than any other army. Like and by a lot. Uh huh. They just can't so, use it all. But, I mean, yeah. Well, that's the thing. You don't have to use it all, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're, exactly. the fact that they're shipping things over to the other armies is like uh -huh. proof yeah, yeah. of how rich they are. <laughs> yeah, Mikhail um, smugly seemed like, like, hey, hey, you need this, right? Your little army needs this, right? Here, you can have it. Take it and take this unit Aesthetic too. Army. Like it's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take yeah, this mage this too. <laughs> Take this mage. Uh -huh. I don't know. Take this swordmaster or dragon rider too, if you need. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> I've, I I I usually steal one of them. At uh -huh. least. Um, but I can in any you. case, the yeah. Go ahead. The, Sorry, we're we're the, drifting the, the off topic. That, go ahead. Yeah, we're drifting again. <laughs> let's get let's get back to Laura. Um, I, I I do think again, it's just she can give you such a good return. Also, again, so when you're using healers, one kind of unsung fact about healers is that they do actually increase the combat exp of your other combat units um because if there's fewer combat units on the board then there's fewer units like stealing the xp or distributing them out which means it's easier to concentrate them into some people this is now, like if strong... you if you were to undeploy a fighting unit for laura right yeah if you were yeah. to undeploy like theoretically if it's yeah. between laura and a fighting unit um it's kind of a very similar thing with like dancers for example and like mm -hmm. It's it's a very easy way to if someone's having difficulty like focusing XP into people's like dude just undeploy some of these people right like it's gonna hurt just undeploy them and have like utility guys here instead and like we've talked about all these things that Laura can contribute for it's definitely better than a lot of combat units on the Dawn Brigade maps and just keeping on deploying her is an excellent idea really yeah I agree this uh, we still ended up saying a lot of things about Laura uh, let's yeah. see. How long are you running right now? We might have to split this up. Yeah, oh, we, can, we can definitely do yeah. at least one more. We definitely do at least one more. Uh, because Souls is here. No, we, we can't skip Souls, right? We can't skip Souls. We can't skip Souls. No. We can... <laughs> let's, let's get, like... Do you think we can get through, like, up to the Jailhouse crew? And then maybe that's enough, or no? What is the Jailhouse crew? Uh, we we'll still need Oyana and Iran after this. Oh, yeah. We'll try. We'll try. <clears throat> we'll try. We'll try. All right. Uh, so... Th I, I mean, I pretty much showed what he what he's there for in this army, and especially on ignorance, I leaned on Soth a lot, and I, it was it was a bit of a double feel because on one hand, I love using overpowered units that are way better than the enemies around them, and trying to use them to the maximum potential to kill as much as possible. At the same time, it's what I usually already do when I'm playing Radiant Dawn, so it felt a bit like I was playing the same game over again. I do like to vary it up a little bit between playthroughs. And with Soth around, it's really hard to justify doing that, as, again, especially on Ignorance. But, I mean, there's a reason this guy got, like, what, three or four forges to his name? And there's a reason he has, like, so much XP, despite the fact that he doesn't gain much per combat. He's just that good. He's super good movement type, too. Uh, one to range is a very high rarity, especially with such combat in combination. Like, there's a couple of other good units you get with that good one to range. But we're talking, like, Black Knight, Tornado, 1-6, like... Tor mod, I think he's better than Tor mod in most cases. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he can steal stuff for you as well. Uh, he has the attack support with Makaya to have even more power. He, I uh, used the Beast Killer, which is very good in one four and will come in handy in part three for sure a couple times. Um, he just has so much bulk. I, I just find Soth really invigorating to use, and I've I've definitely said this before, but if you're having trouble with any Dawn Brigade map, especially one three, that's the big one. Uh, the answer is probably just use more Soth. If you can just throw Soth at a couple of enemies, your life will be much better. You might think, well, he's going to steal my XP and I'm going to I want to train my other units. This will make it easier because if your turn one is a massive Soth slaughter, then you can probably isolate one or two enemies to feed to your Edwards and your Leos and your Nolans. And they'll have an easier time than if you're trying to chip down the first three enemies you fight and then like three more come in and you just get piled and surrounded. And, you know, Soth is great, but he can't be in five places at once. He can't choke five points at once. But if you just have him choke to one point, take out a couple of enemies, and then you can feed your other units. And then Soth is also good at setting up kills for other units if you want to use him that way, because he comes with, like, a bronze knife you can use, and that never crits. Oh, yeah. So he just used that to chip enemies down. Um, again, it's kind of hard in ignorance, because I look at Soth, I have no idea how much damage he's going to do, even with a bronze knife. But usually he'll chip him down, and he can kill with someone else. So he can do that little thing that like, people love FE6 markers for. He can do that too, except with one to range. Like, what's not to love? He's so good. I love Soth. Yeah, I, I do think... I, I'm really glad you brought out the Bronze Dagger because it's such, like, a unique feature to him compared to other, like, Jagans of the series, essentially. Where... So, with, with Soth, if you have his Bronze Dagger equipped and he's not near Micaiah for the support, 
I think there's like a handful of enemies that he'll kill. And everyone else, he extremely reliably chips down to very low HP, like 100 hit, zero crit. You know exactly what you're getting. Chip down to zero, or not down to zero, but like chip down to low HP uh, for another Don Brigade member to come by and kill them. And it's a very unique feature among the Jagans. Like I know with Marcus, you say like with FP6 Marcus, okay, but sometimes you got to pay the tax, right? Where he Iron Sword crits. Yes, it's especially like, because okay, the boss in chapter the... one, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And that what well, that. We, we did a playthrough of every six. We kept off paying the Marcus tax. It's like, oh, come on. Seriously, again, bro? Mm -hmm. But, um... So you don't have to worry about that whatsoever. Of course, he does have the card. So if you absolutely want to kill things, then he has the card as well. And then the Forge 1-2s. Becca, I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. Okay. I have two Radiant Dawn ISOs in front of me. Or CDs, rather. Because mm -hmm. we're playing on CDs. Um, mm -hmm. One of them doesn't have Soth. One of them doesn't have Horror. Which one's more difficult? Ooh, <laughs> I love that question. Uh, so... Like, on tier lists, I always have Har above Soth, because I think the level that Har dominates his part, even though his companions are better, the level that the dominance that Har describes throughout the entire game, too, is like, it's so, so, so massive. Like, the level mm -hmm. is... I love Har so much for that. And I also think Har is better long term. Uh, of course, by long term, I mean part 4, and part 4, you have the most alternatives you could possibly have, so... If you want to make do with other units, you know, it's, skipping on a part 4 utility is probably the way to go. But like I said, Dawn Brigade chapters without Soth, ugh, ugh, Nolan's back is breaking already yeah. just by like, mentioning it. It's like, jeez. Like, if and, Nolan and doesn't get good level ups, like, ouch, dude, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... And for, and for people who haven't played Radiant Dawn as much, I'm asking this question as a way to pose that perhaps he's the strongest unit in the game. Yeah, yeah, um, I know what you're getting at. I, I, uh, I... Just to, for the audience, it would it would not be strange to say that the game would be harder if you didn't have Soth, your 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 little CD, whatever that is. I'm not all just mm -hmm. kidding. Um, yeah, yeah. I think the game would be harder without Soth than without Har. I do think in the tier list, I'd still put Har above because flyer bias. I mean, utility counting. Um, yes. But yeah, mm -hmm. no. I Soth is is a better pain relief than Har. In that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, he's he's a crazy good unit, and just, like, don't, like, don't be afraid to use him. I will say he does fall off. Like, let's let's be honest here, okay? Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're worried he's going to fall off, worry no more. He does, all right? But, like... Not because of his growths. His growths are great. Yeah, it's for, for other reasons, like... Yeah, T-Barn reasons? T-Barn re Oh, well, no. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm actually saying, like, you know, as far as stats-wise goes, yeah. like, it's, it's, it's incredibly hard to make this guy, like, good later on. I've never seen it done. Mm-hmm. I've seen, my comment section claims it all the time. I, I do want to wear these people stream because uh, part four soul is painful. He doesn't. You can't even promote to tier three until the game gives him permission. Four, so he's like part part four. Okay, like part part, part four soul is like part one. You know, like Edward or Nolan, where like they're getting by, right? Yeah. But what, wasn't all this where like yeah, Edward's the best unit, but like but he's getting by, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, he he functions. He doesn't do great. Yeah. It's like, uh, anyway. it's like it's like it's like prologue Edward, but you also have Har and Jill. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At tier three, <laughs> does it doesn't it doesn't look much better. <laughs> Basically, that's a pretty good way to put it. I hadn't <laughs> thought of that, but yeah, no. I mean, that's Soth in a nutshell. He's pretty good. Use him. Mm -hmm. Always, always use Soth. Uh, okay, that's the that's those. Um, I mean, when, it, when you sort of saw it, said. Um, the, the jailhouse crew. I thought you might be referring to Ileana and Aron because I joined in the chapter where you escaped from prison, but that's not what we're going for. Uh, don't mind yeah, the inventory I, that I have on Ileana here. This is just a 1E save uh, set up to pass things to the Grand Mercenaries. Normally she has like Thunder, Arc Thunder, or Thunder, L Thunder, and a Fallen, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I I think I, I don't remember how in how much detail I talked about Ileana in her joining chapter, but my experience with Ileana is uh, quite pleasant in 1-3. Uh, I remember her like doubling the fighters there, which is super nice to have. I think a few people will even do that. And then everything else is still like chip. The thing with Liliana is her chip is a little bit inaccurate. She d does have the tendency to miss. I, I want to say her hit rates are, assuming like equal buyer with them, no terrain and everything is like in the 70s-ish. Which is enough to where like you'll go for it and not... You'll go for it, but it's also enough to be, like make you regret it right after a lot of the time. Yeah. Like a non insignificant amount of time that can kind of sting and as the game continues you'll keep that problem but you also have to add a problem of Ileana doesn't gain enough stats I remember 
they don't really keep up with enemies very well. Even within Dawn Brigade, she's still like, she gets by because the enemies aren't that much stronger, but they do have plenty of res, so her damage output compared to others is not that great. Uh, Forging a Thunder, if you want to use her long term, is definitely recommended just to get the hit. Like, the, you, you're going to take the Might anytime because it's Forging, but the hit is also very welcome if you're doing that. And then she's kind of fine. But then she leaves, and then she comes back in the Grow Mercenaries, which for any unit with any reasonable stats would be would be good. But uh, unfortunately, I've had the pleasure to of trying to use her because people bribe me, and mm -hmm. uh, that um, she was not very good. She's like it was like using like units like Liar almost like that bad, but on a mage instead, which in some ways is an advantage because you know two range is kind of nice to have on a unit that's not very good stat wise. But yeah, no. Um, wouldn't recommend if you're looking for a painless time. It was it was a bit of a painful thing to do, but you know, good availability, I guess. That's that's good for her, but it's kind of annoying for everyone around her who has to make sure she doesn't die. <laughs> I guess. Like yeah. she she technically does have like really good availability. She does. It's like the best in the game, I think. And uh, yeah, I, I don't give her credit for passing things to Merc, but it's absolutely something you should do if you're playing the game. Uh, a little trick where you promote her to get an extra skill slot uh, is pretty nice. Or skill slot, uh, extra skill capacity to give her more skills. In fact, I could have even, now that I'm looking at it again, I think I could have given her a 10 capacity skill as well, in addition to what I, I gave her. The only, the only 10 capacity skill you have at this point is Discipline. So uh, Cancel? Oh, maybe. Yeah, you can't give her advantage, I guess, but you could put it in your, in your inventory, I guess, if you deploy in the chapter. That's kind of about it, I guess I forgot about cancel, but... Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, well, we don't have it anyway, so. Yeah, no, we don't have it. This is, <laughs> this is something I thought of. I think cancel's 10 anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think she's okay and then falls off very fast. Like, it's like, I think if she joined in one prologue, it wouldn't even be that much different. It's just, like, kind of having another Edward in that way, where, like, utility is good in her joining chapter and just... Falls off a cliff right after. That's kind of the way I think about yeah. Ileana. But uh, you know, I, she can, in in normal easy difficulties again, this problem is really mitigated. Uh, faster XP gain really helps her a lot, I think, in that regard. Oh yeah, no, for sure. Um, I will say about Ileana that she's kind of in this like really awkward zone. Like she she's kind of like Nolan, right? Just right on the line. But she's I think in Nolan's a particularly much better, awkward personally. zone. Yeah, way better to be honest. Um. Where and I think it was I, I think it was mute who she was speedrunning like normal mode, oh and on yeah, and I think she said like oh Yana's really awkward because her stats when she joins are like totally amazing, so you want to allocate the really important tasks to her, but her accuracy is so bad that when she fails there was a really important task that you didn't get right yes you know <laughs> like it's. You, you don't want to use her on something kind of like trivial or that doesn't matter because that's such a waste of her stats. Mm -hmm. But if you put her... Yeah, someone to like worse is going to have really... to do the task instead. Yeah. Yeah. If you put her to like a really important problem, there's a decent chance that this really important thing doesn't get done. And so it's like, oh, what do you do then? From then on out. So she, she, she is kind of awkward in that regard. And I guess at that point, it's like, what, like, Raisins, what are you doing? Complaining about her really good stats? No, just her bad accuracy, mm -hmm. um, which is totally fixed, by the way, by a forge. Um, I, I do think she's one of the units who it's really strong to give her a forge early on. Uh, it lasts a long time. And the other thing, too, about forging a thunder is that, like, every mage in the game can use it, right? So you can trade it to Tormod later if you want to, because Tormod also has an issue with accuracy. So giving him, like, a plus hit thunder tome is rather nice. Uh, you can trade it over to Soren later. Um, you can pass it around all you like, like having a big Forge Thunder Tome is rather handy. Like any map where you fight Wyverns, which is a lot of them. So I, I do think that she's pretty good in that regard. Uh, she has a really easy access to a strong Forge and you don't have, you don't worry about that she falls off. She can still continue using that and that makes her useful for several more maps. Um, I do totally agree. Like she just completely falls off. Like it, it's, it's really hard to make an Oyana and have her stats like stay really good for for a long period of time it's, it's extremely difficult mm -hmm. i think it's because she's made like if they made her strong enough for the grimmer snare she'd be way too strong for the dawn brigade probably oh yeah so you have no. to kind of balance it in the way they went to see just guts her gut her her grimmer's performance yeah the the grail mercenaries have to fight like way harder enemies than the dawn brigade do mm -hmm. all right um we're done with Eliana, right yeah, like, yeah i have, no, I have no. nothing well, left I, okay there's passing the items over, okay, but we kind of like went in. We, yeah. we went into detail on that on the one E episode. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like what yeah. You, what you could theoretically pass that's useful. Yes, uh, Aran. So this is a unit that 
is like super unremarkable just because he's he's meant to be like generic like i'm pretty sure this is an intentional joke by the devs to make him look generic he's like a soldier uh with like a pretty generic looking face unremarkable mm -hmm. name uh kind of uniform stats uh he even look he's like hard to spot in your army if he's like not done a turn yet you know what i mean so yeah. <laughs> uh in a lot of ways they kind of want to make him generic but he has a lot of fans i think it's because soldier is such a cool class that we don't get to use very often uh, in games until much later when it started to become more mainstays. But Aron, unless you play Black Path of Radiance, probably your first like playable soldier. Unless you play, I guess Gaiden Lucas exists as well. But generally, Aron is like one of the first playable soldiers you have in the series, and one of the only ones. It's a very unique trait, and that's why people like him. The other reason people like him is because he theoretically has tank potential. Uh, he has a high defense growth. People like to refer to him as. Like an armor knight, but with six move instead, or an armor knight in the form of a soldier, disguised as a soldier, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that uh, description. Uh, I think Aran has tanky issues that are similar to Nolan's, but a bit worsens because he has a worse base level. Uh, he has very low base HP, 24. So even though his defense is like higher than someone like, I don't know, Edward or something, I find that he still dies in maybe not the same number of hits, but a number of hits that's kind of close. It's too close for Edward for him to be called a tank, is the way I see it. And then there's some other random issues, like I think some enemies can crit him because of his low base luck. Uh, his speed is worse than Nolan's, and I already said that Nolan's vulnerable to getting doubled sometimes, so around really has it bad. Uh, I don't think he's unusable, but you really have to commit really hard to a unit in Dom Brigade for him to keep up with the XP curve, like I said before. And Aran is never your best option for those. There's always a unit better than him. I think Nolan is better than him in almost every regard. And we already talked about the issues that Nolan has. So you, can't, you don't really want to use and invest in both. And I also think Jill is better. Uh, Jill has like the same base HP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she like flies around. I think she has the same defense too, come to think of it. Oh god. Or close to it. Like I just... I just don't find... Yeah. Um, also, I think Aran has another weird issue where he can't one-shot enemies with Beastful. I forgot which enemies. I think it might be Tigers, but not Cats. I think he can one-shot Cats with a Force Steel on Beastful. But I think he falls short on Tigers. Um, now, that's okay, because he could probably double them if he has enough speed, because uh, Tigers are pretty slow. Uh, but it means he takes a counterattack on the same turn, which means he probably has to get physical if he's really tanking a bunch of enemies. Uh, I just think there's a lot of issues with Aran. I will admit that all of this comes from years and years of debating Fire Emblem Online between uh, two people that really loved arguing over this. Like, they hated each other, but they loved arguing so much that they kept doing it. Uh, one of them was in favor of Nephany, the other one was in favor of Aran. They were always arguing about which oh, was better, no. which is... It's basically just like, basically comparing the entirety of Rain and Dawn to each other. That's basically what that is. Because they're never in the same army until part four. And it just, it just went on and on and on. It was an absolute spectacle. Definitely want to make a video about it at one point because it was just so great. If I can ever Google the, find the right post, I will definitely cover it because it's such a great part of my final history. Oh no, <laughs> it's so funny. Um, well, Dan Ved. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, that, there was usually like some kind of contrarian threats going like, oh, Dan Ved is obviously the best one. Um, not me, trust me. Anyway, uh, the point is, I have some bias against Iran. I'll admit it, uh, but I did use him in my playthrough with Bismix, the, the the regular rating down playthrough, and. I wasn't super impressed. I was like, there were some parts where I was definitely having fun with Aran and where I actually he got to shine a little bit. Uh, but I was, like I said, I was using too many units. If I really wanted to give Aran a fair shot, I'd have to make him my carry. Like I'd have to only train like him and maybe Jill or him and I mean, one other unit, give, give or take like one of the many units we've named. And then I'd have a fair shot at evaluating how good Aran is probably. Uh, but I think he has the same issues that Nolan has, but a bit worse. And that's why I don't like him like using him personally, and why I don't rate him very highly. Uh, that said, he can shove a fair amount of people, he can rescue a fair amount of people, so even at base level, he can have some utility, despite it all. So, I don't think he's absolutely worthless. I do like deploying him every now and then, uh, but I don't like using, investing XP into him. That's the way I see Aran. What about you? Yeah, I, I think the shoves is probably his most notable feature. Like, he, he can shove Soth, he can shove Zhark. That's pretty good. Thumbs up from me. He can rescue both of them. That's pretty good. Thumbs up from me, right? Like, it, 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 it's pretty easy to make him useful in that regard. Um, as far as his defense goes, there are like a few funny things I've done. Like, I think I had, um, I think I think there's one just casual run I did where I was having like 0% Z Hark, like tank all six of the calves on the left side of, uh, what is it, 162? You remember, like, where we trained up Volug? No, no, no. We trained Volug Strike Rank on the right. But, like, you know, you know that army. I killed of six all those calves, calves with Soth in this playthrough, right? yes, because we didn't have a good 
uh, allocation for XP. But yeah, I know what you mean. Like th that's where you should yeah. change your yeah. Exactly. There, there, there are some times where I do funny stuff like that, where it's like, oh, let me see if I can get zero percent of runs to take this, or zero percent of runs. Yeah. <laughs> and like, it, it, it can be done. That's usually the moral of the story. Is like, it can be done, um, in, in more places than you would think. But overall, like the the amount of investment and effort it takes to get there is like at that point, okay, I could do that, or I could just use Soth, um, like, and he does it too, or I could just use Tarneo and he does it too. Um, I, I really do think he's pretty similar to Nolan except just worse in every category like I, I actually think his stats are they just worse than Nolan's in every category oh no skill um, but like come on get out of here mm -hmm. um, I have one yeah. more thing to bring up if you're if you're done that I just realized that people are gonna bring yeah, up kind of. and that's um, people usually like to say that Aran has a very good potential at bonus experience abuse which is something I haven't really talked about uh, where if you have a unit cap a couple stats that they're good at then you have a better chance of bringing up the other stats using bonus XP because you're forced to bring up three stats with bonus XP. Uh, we've covered it a couple times in the playthrough already. And mm -hmm. uh, it, the method itself is, is valid, uh, but it has a big drawback in hard mode. And I've, I've actually demonstrated this almost every episode that we've done. It's like, look at how little bonus XP we have and look at how little I can do with it. Uh, I, I was like, I have all my bonus XP and it takes, them, it takes the entire pool to level up a unit like Nolan one level. So in part one, there's like no room to do that in hard mode. Normal mode and easy mode, this is completely different. Now, Aran is a completely different unit in normal mode. Same for Edward, same for all these units that use Bix very well, because um, they will grow so much faster that they will cap stats early on, and you have four times as much big speed bonus experience to work with. So you can actually abuse that method a lot more. But in hard mode, you have like, almost none of it. It's just so hard to do. And until like part three, uh, when units are like in tier two, uh, you just don't have enough big, big speed to really significantly impact the unit stats using that method. Part three, I can see it helping a little bit, uh, but again, really still want to focus it on like a very small amount of units and Aran is not going to be one of the best ones to do it with. It is a valid method, but I don't think it helps Aran in hard mode. Not not significantly, a little bit, uh, but it has serious drawbacks because of the little bonus XP you get. So I know yeah, it exists. You don't, have to, you don't have to comment, hey, bonus experience will do this and this. I know. I don't think it helps him as, as, that much. Yeah, I don't see how it helps Aran in any like more particular way than it helps, say, like, Jill or Nolan mm -hmm. or Eliana, maybe it's maybe, maybe this is just me being like narrow minded towards this idea, and I should probably be more generous to it. But it's like I don't, I I, I don't really see how you're like capping any of his stats on on hard mode mm -hmm. without like significant investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one thing I could do, is, I could see, is that because his strength and defense growth are quite high, uh, he could back spell level and almost guarantee that he gets both. Maybe, but like almost guarantee. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, like so you're resetting her levels. I mean, like okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That. okay yeah. Something like that. It, it, it's, it's usually brought up to boost levels. his speed because you would like cap strength and defense, and then you back his speed or something. I think that's the idea. Uh, again, totally valid for normal mode, and definitely recommended there if you're using around because it really helps him there, but not in hard mode. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is probably the shortest one so far. I think so, yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, it was still like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Meg, I mean, Meg is a joke unit. I I like using joke units, but in ignorance, it's pretty pretty difficult. That's why I decided not to use her as, as difficult as it is. I forged a sword called the Magnificent. That's that's how close I got to using Meg in this playthrough. Uh, she can shove a couple of people. Apparently not Z-Hark. I keep forgetting about that. I think she can't shove Z-Hark or she can't rescue him. One of the two. Um, but that's that's unfortunate because I would really love to be able to do, use, utilize that utility. Uh, so think of all the things that make Aran worse than Nolan, and then take another step down. And I think you pretty much get Meg stat-wise. Like her HP is even worse, and then her defense and strength are also worse overall. Uh, slightly better speed and speed growth, I think. Some people like to say that Meg is a Pegasus Knight disguised as an Armor Knight stat-wise. I could see it, but uh, I prefer to take a Pegasus Knight with Armor Knight stats personally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was me. Like like, is, is she, though, mm. like, better than any of that? I don't think she's better than Aran in any, like, category. No. Um, she's no. better luck, so she doesn't have a chance to get crit by cats in 1-4. I think that's about it. That's, that's Oh, she has kind a 0% chance to get crit, in fact. Get it right. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, it's, 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 it's if you don't turn her fortune into a forge, as is. <laughs> yeah, details, details. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I got from Meg, is those, those little funny little details, because I've never really used her long term. I think she was the one bad unit I did not use in my Iron Man playthrough. I used Fiona, uh, I used Liar, I used Ileana, I used all those low tier people, 
but I didn't use Meg. So next time I'm doing a playthrough where I can actually afford to do it, I definitely will use Meg and I will enjoy pink armor girl slashing people in half with swords and I, and I will enjoy every second of it. Uh, until then though, I don't really have any on hands experience or a desire to use Meg in combat because it usually ends in disaster. Just, her bases are too low, <laughs> but she's very funny and I appreciate funny units. Yeah, it's it, it, it's really hard to find like even a little bit of utility out of this unit. I'm gonna be honest, and I'm the kind of guy who like if there is anything to be found, I'll I'll, I'll try to find it right. But um, I, I do think the best thing about Meg is actually her affinity. Uh, if we go over to that, Heaven affinity is, in my opinion, it's like it's madly underrated. Uh, really strong on Iron Man's, really strong on uh, any anything where you care about reliability. Heaven affinity provides plus nine hit when you get it which is like basically weapon triangle all the time if you think about it it's it's hmm. such a massive boost even a single point of heaven affinity and then you get a second one it's like plus 18 hit uh, it, it really is massive of course like keeping meg around in order to do that is kind of tricky uh but there are plenty of places in like the upcoming maps where it's really not that hard to like have meg like especially on say like three six it's not that hard to find a safe place for meg she's providing support to even like kind of a Jill, who's out doing like solo missions, or it's like Volo who's chilling in a tree. It's really not hard to get this heaven affinity to apply. So I think that's I think that's the best part of Meg, and then everything else is kind of like rubbish, frankly. Yeah, once you hit part three and deployment slots free up, we had a lot. Of, they had a lot of trouble free like deploying people that we even wanted to deploy in like part one. But in part three, we have less units and more slots, so you can just put Meg anywhere. Uh, I also bring up on that note that Meg can ledge block in three thirteen, and as stupid as that sounds, because you literally just have to exist to do that. It's valuable, and I like having it a lot. It's just like, it just kind of shuts down like five Lagoos at once when you do it, and it's super powerful. Yeah, <laughs> it still counts. So, still counts. Uh, that's Meg. Uh, so we wanted to try and get up to the prison squad, right? I think we can, we can, yeah. we can try and make it work. How long have we been going? Well, this is like one and a half hour. Well, well uh, we're past the prison squad now, so. Oh yeah, we're, we're past the first prison squad. I thought you wanted to go for like Fika Tormat Moram. Is that not true? Oh, no, the other... Okay. I, I was talking about the first prison, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, you actually were. Okay, in that case, uh, let's see, we did like... We did nine here. There's like nine left, ten left, I guess, if we count them, but they're shorter. We, we could call it a break here. We could do the next one uh, some okay. other time, and we'll see if I make it like a whole video out of the two episodes or not. Uh, but, you know, if this was... If this is a part one, if there's a part one in the title, then uh, this is where we say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll see you guys, and we'll we'll get these guys later. The good ones. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll get better things to say about these guys. Yeah, we've been praising like all the late units all episode long, and now it's like, well, we'll get to the good ones next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Peace. Bye, everyone.